The WHO estimated that in 2011, there were 1.1 million new or recurrent cases of TB in people living with HIV worldwide, which is around 13% of total TB cases. The burden of HIV TB is highly concentrated in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, which account for 79% of all cases. Disease rates are highest in the countries towards the south of the continent, where HIV prevalence is highest, and here between 50 and 80% of TB cases are HIV co-infected. One country alone, South Africa, accounts for almost 30% of all HIV TB cases worldwide. Now, outside Africa, TB is also a common opportunistic infection in people living with HIV in Southeast Asia and South America, and also among HIV infected injection drug users in the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. HIV TB causes around 430,000 deaths each year, and all, although, the, although these are classified as HIV deaths in the International Classification of Diseases. Around one third of people who die with TB are HIV co-infected and conversely around a quarter of global HIV AIDS deaths have TB as the underlying cause. So TB is the leading cause of death in people living with HIV worldwide. TB diagnosis in resource limited settings relies heavily on sputum smear microscopy and chest radiology and both of these are impaired in people with HIV co-infection. TB diagnosis by sputum smear requires the release of TB bacilli, that's Mycobacterium tuberculosis, in sufficient numbers so that there are at least 10,000 organisms per mill of sputum and that's the limits of detection of the assay. However, HIV impairs the host response to TB such that the, in co-infected patients there is reduced immunopathology in the lungs, which means there's less inflammation, less lung tissue damage. And as a result, lower concentrations of bacilli are liberated into sputum. As a result, sputum smears are much more likely to be negative. And this issue is further compounded by the fact that when patients have advanced disease and are very weak, maybe in patients, it can be very difficult for them to uh, cough up good sputum samples. In addition to smear microscopy, chest radiology is also less useful in those with HIV co-infection. And again, it's because of reduced immunopathology. The chest radiographic appearances are often non-specific, and they really lack the typical characteristics of pulmonary TB that you see in HIV negative patients. So HIV co-infection also increases the frequency of extra pulmonary disease, which again makes it more difficult to diagnose. So the huge challenge of diagnosis of HIV TB is graphically illustrated by a number of post-mortem studies of patients dying with HIV and AIDS in hospitals in sub-Saharan Africa. And these studies have repeatedly shown that between a third and a half of patients had evidence of TB at death, much of which is disseminated, but much of which also remained undiagnosed at the time of death. culture of clinical samples, especially in liquid media, uh, is the assay with the highest sensitivity for TB diagnosis. However, this is slow, often yielding results in, in weeks rather than days. It's technologically demanding and expensive, and it's really only feasible in centralized laboratories. And for these reasons, it's just generally not available in many resource-limited settings. However, a real landmark development is the expert MTB RIF assay, uh, and this was endorsed by WHO for use in resource limited settings in December 2010. This is a, it's a simplified, fully automated, real-time PCR assay system that's cartridge-based and requires very limited training for operation. It takes just two hours to generate a result and has much higher sensitivity than sputum smear microscopy. A single test can detect all smear positive cases and around 70 to 75% are smear negative cases. So that's a, a huge advance. However, there are a number of drawbacks. The hardware is sophisticated and expensive, and each cartridge, even at heavily subsidized prices, costs 10 US dollars. Moreover, its use will be largely confined to laboratory settings, as it's difficult to implement this at the actual point of care within the clinic environment. And when use is restricted to the laboratory, results cannot be used to inform immediate treatment decisions, and that's a major drawback. So what's really needed is a low-cost point-of-care assay that can be used to reliably diagnose TB and allow TB treatment to be started at the same clinic visit. Now, the determined TB LAM assay is one such test, and it's been recently uh, made commercially available. And although this test has not yet been endorsed, 
and we need much more evidence to, from ongoing studies, I think the assay really has potential to play a useful role in diagnosis of HIV TB. Lipoarabinamanin, or LAM for short, is a glycolipid component of the cell wall of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's produced in large quantities by the organi organism. And I think this probably relates to the fact that it's immunomodulatory, favoring survival of, of the organism in the human host. Now, LAM can be detected in the urine of a proportion of patients with TB, even if the primary focus of the disease is remote from the, from the renal tract, for example, pulmonary disease. So LAM is thought to gain entry to the urine either via the bloodstream or via direct involvement to the renal tract by TB in those who've got disseminated disease. But you know, regardless of the mechanism, detection of LAM in urine can be used as a means of TB diagnosis. So TB diagnosis via detection of LAM in urine can be done in the laboratory using a simple polyclonal antibody sandwich ELISA in a 96 well plate format. Uh, and the initial diagnostic accuracy studies of the LAM assays were done using this format of the assay. But the assay is now being developed into a simple lateral flow strip test format, which is a, an immunochromatographic assay that looks a bit like a urine pregnancy test. So the test, all you need is a fresh urine sample, and you just apply 60 microliters to the sample pad at the bottom of the test strip, and it doesn't require any prior uh, uh, processing. And you leave the strip for around 25 minutes, during which time the urine soaks up the uh, test strip and immobilized capture and detection antibodies labeled with colloidal gold lead to the development of a purple band in the test window. And if that band is of sufficient intensity when compared to a reference card, it's then scored as a positive test for LAM and uh, infers probable diagnosis of TB. So there's been a series of studies published since 2009 using urine LAM assays, and these shown that the utility of LAM detection for TB diagnosis is really restricted to patients with HIV infection and advanced immunodeficiency. It's not useful if you're HIV negative, it's not useful if you're HIV positive and have got a high CD4 cell count. So you can only really use this test to, uh, uh, to apply to selected patients. In those who you know are HIV infected and have got CD4 counts less than, say, 200 cells per microliter, the test is useful. And the lower the CD4 cell count and the sicker the patients, as defined by a range of characteristics, the greater the sensitivity for TB diagnosis. And the likely reason for this is that the sicker the patients, the much more likely they are to have disseminated disease and therefore have LAM in the urine. So the sensitivity of the test entirely depends on the particular characteristics the patients tested. So in ambulatory outpatients with CD4 counts of less than 50, the test sensitivity is maximal around two-thirds of cases. Among inpatients who are, of course, sicker, the proportion will be higher. Among ambulatory outpatients with lower CD4 counts, the sensitivity will be lower. So it all depends on the patient population you're applying the test to. So the major advantages of the test are obvious. The, the test is low cost. It's currently marketed around uh, $3.50 US dollars per test. It's rapid, uh, results available within 25 minutes at a single clinic consultation. And it doesn't require any equipment or sophisticated hardware. Uh, urine samples are easy to obtain, even in sick patients in, in hospital who may find it very difficult to cough up sputum samples. Uh, urine's safe, it's easy to handle and testing could readily be done by nursing staff following limited training. But most importantly, it can be used at the point of care, at the clinic consultation, allowing TB diagnosis and the start of treatment at a single clinic visit. And this is the way by which it may potentially really reduce treatment delays. So the disadvantages of the test are that it can only be applied to specific patient subgroups, those who've got confirmed HIV and those who've got advanced immunodeficiency. Uh, whether that's defined by CD4 count criteria or WHO clinical staging. So the sensitivity assay is limited, and so it can only be used to, as a test to diagnose TB. You can't use it to rule out TB. Now, while several well-conducted studies of both the LAMELISA and the point-of-care version of assays have found high assay specificities, others have found its specificity to be more limited. Whether this is true or whether it's an artifact of study design it remains to be fully clarified. 
And finally, we're not quite sure what the optim optimal cutoff for scoring the point of care strip test is, uh, uh, scoring them as positive or negative. Uh, we need to take the, into account both the ease of use by the healthcare workers and also the diagnostic accuracy. The very faint bands may be true positives, but if they're difficult to read by healthcare workers, it may lead to a, a false positive rate as well. So we need a range of further studies to clarify the use of the uh, uh, TB LAM point of care assay. We need a, a greater evidence base on diagnostic accuracy. We need operational research to uh, clarify its use in the clinical environment rather than the laboratory environment. And finally, we also need large-scale studies to, uh, to assess the impact of implementation on clinical outcomes. Can this assay really uh, reduce deaths? There are several characteristics of the determined TB LAM assay that make it potentially very useful in resource-limited settings. And I think one of the key observations is that although the sensitivity of the assay is somewhat limited, the sensitivity is highest in the very subset of patients who've got the worst prognostic characteristics and are at highest risk of dying. Uh, and secondly, the assay allows TB to be diagnosed and treated at a single clinic visit. Uh, and that's a huge step forward. So there's the real potential to accelerate both diagnosis and treatment and thereby reduce mortality risk. But the assay, we must understand, it's not a standalone assay, and it needs to be used in combination with other assays. And in fact, if you use it in combination, there's incremental sensitivity when used in combination with sputum smear microscopy or sputum expert MTB RIF testing. So the LAM assay shortens the time to diagnosis in the sickest patients, allowing immediate treatment, and it increases the overall sensitivity when used in combination with other assays whose results may be available in the following days. So I think this assay may come to play an important role in the diagnostic algorithm. And there are two key clinical populations in which the assay may come to play an important role. First, the assay can be used as a screen for TB in HIV-infected outpatients who are accessing antiretroviral treatment clinics. And also in inpatients, uh, it can be used to screen and diagnose TB in HIV-infected inpatients who are sick. Uh, by shortening the time to diagnosis in these two key patient groups, we we'll hope that their mortality risk will be reduced. And so the real goal of this assay and the potential of the assay to make a difference is to reduce deaths from HIV-TB.